the struggle against fascism in DC. Uh, I haven't read this, so yeah. Uh, I'm gonna read to like page 10 and then you'll read the rest probably. Alright. Um, yeah. In Washington, D.C., at the heart of the white settler colonial state, local communities have long defended themselves against many different forms of oppression. In the following historical overview, we trace the roots of anti-fascist organizing in D.C. through the first two decades of the 21st century. Fascism is a pressing threat here in the capital of the so-called United States unoccupied... I don't know how to say that, honestly. Do you? This Cadillac. Yeah, there you go. That sounds right. Days... I didn't even want to try... Days before the first un Unite the Right, the deadly white supremacist rally in Charlottesville in August 2017, Nazis brandishing guns and Confederate flags rode through, this, through so Southeast D.C., a, historical, a historically black neighborhood, two months later. In October 2017, Richard Collins III, a black University of Maryland student, was murdered by a fascist. Meanwhile, in the suburban communities around D.C., police and sheriffs cooperate with ICE through 287G to kidnap, imprison, and deport immigrants in plain clothes and uniform. Fascism grows when we ignore it. In 1982, hundreds of D.C. residents responded to the first Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan rally in 57 years. The New York Times reported on the press conference with which the Klan opened the day. Mr. Robb, raising his voice to its best pulpit level, declared that illegal aliens were run ruining America. When you say aliens, are you talking about E.T.? shouted one reporter. Another asked, will you, will you accept protection from black police officers today? While Mr. Robb was coping with the press, the other Klansmen quietly disappeared to accept the police offer to escort them quietly to Lafayette Park. Through the, through the back streets, the rally lasted only 15 minutes. The Klansmen were escorted out by federal police under a hail of stones and bottles. Afterwards, anti-racist demonstrators attacked businesses, police, and symbols of capitalism. It was not the what, what symbols of capitalism. I, that's what I wonder. Money. They just burned money. That'd be <laughs> wild. It was not the first time that D.C. residents showed the far right that D.C. means don't come. So the anti-racist movement in D.C. didn't start as a reaction to Donald Trump. It was already present in the 1960s when black communities organized for liberation. It was present in 1991 when the Latino neighborhood at Mount Pleasant rose up against police. It was present in 2007 when D.C. anti-racist action confronted the Klan in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. The current round of anti-fascist work began during the recession following the collapse of the anti globalization and anti-war movements activists began asking how the shift from the summit hopping model to focus on localized conflict wait activists began asking how to sh oh i see the emergence of the tea party generated concern but it did not provoke an anti-racist or anti-fascist response at the time owing to the legacy of groups like anti-racist action anti-fascism was associated with small clashes between sub subcultural groups rather than understood as a strategy with which to counter widespread far-right organizing. Temporarily incapacitated by Obama's electoral victory, anarchists could only muster small pranks such as passing out signs that said privatized military hospitals, now a serious policy proposal of the right, and leading chants of tea bag on, the, on this lawn all day. At the time, few could read the tea leaves to see what the future held. Shutting down the American Renaissance Conference. It took us years to climb back from the humiliation of being canceled, Jared Taylor referring to the 2010 conference. In spring 2010, anarchists involved with the self-described anarchists collective led a research team with social media and social media campaign to shut down the white supremacist American Renaissance Conference. Uh, Anti-fascists had protested the conference for years already. In the end, a coordinated call in campaign finally forced the conference organizers to leave D.C. Hotel after hotel shut their doors to neo-Nazis as anti-fascists called around, asking if a booking had been made and beseeching the venues to cancel the conference. SDAC shut down every space in D.C. that fascists attempted to reserve in the end. The conference took place at, in a restaurant in Virginia, yet instead of hundreds of suit-and-tie fascists mingling, their numbers were reduced to less than 20. It took the far-right years to recover. Fascists were not able to regain their foothold, foothold in D.C. until 2015. Post-Occupy. 
smash racism DC formed in response to a march called the called for by the Aryan nations in September 2012 on the theme stop white genocide sick in South Africa wait why does it say sick what did they spell wrong strange okay a small group of veterans in the Occupy movement came up with the name and called for a meeting to plan a community response held at U Howard University. The first meeting brought together a mix of students, religious congregants, anarchists, and socialists. At the time, anti-fascists did not have an organized presence in Washington, D.C. Community members largely avoided the label anti-fascist because few people believed that fascist activity could pose a significant threat. Through community outreach that included congregational organizing, public lectures, flyering, and old-fashioned door knocking, Smash Racism DC was able to mobilize about 300 counter-protesters against 20 white supremacists who showed up. Activists created sit-down blockades to stop the Nazis, who were surrounded by phalanxes of riot police. It took the Nazis two hours to reach the Capitol building. They left after 20 minutes of being drowned out by counter-protesters. For the next three years, Smash Smash Racism DC existed largely as a social media presence, highlighting instances of racial and gender inequity, as well as anti-fascist resistance. In fall 2015, anti-racists confronted a Confederate flag rally, seizing flags from fascists and ripping them to shreds inside Union Station. I actually do remember this. I don't know if you do. I don't remember that. It's black. Movie. Yeah. I remember, like, years ago watching a documentary about this. That's pretty sick, though. Yeah. Ferguson, Baltimore, and beyond. Black Lives Matter protests emerge in emerged in D.C. during the Ferguson Uprising at the high point in fall 2014. Protesters took place at the end of every workday. One shut down the 14th Street br Bridge. Black-led organizers organized to end the formal practice of MPD's jump-out squads. Organizers led campaigns to implement the NEAR Act. Neighborhood Engagement Act achieves results in hopes of reducing police presence. Then in spring 2015, D.C.'s sister city, Baltimore, went up in flames following the police murder of Freddie Gray. The struggle against police in inter is intertwined with the struggle against fascism. Everyday police act as an occupying arm. In D.C., the, the city's police gun recovery unit openly wore white supremacist symbols at court. Members of the same unit were caught selling weapons in southeast D.C., as we noted earlier this summer. MPD has committed three murders since May 2018. The National Policy Institute. Even after Trump had announced his candidacy, few people inside D.C. took the threat of fascism seriously, yet white nationalists were openly or organizing in Ta Tawson, M.D., while towns like Frederick, M.D., elected sheriffs tied to white nationalist movements. Fascists around the U.S. were emboldened, as evidenced by Gamergate, Blue Lives Matter memes, and Islamophobic demonstrations at mosques. On Halloween, the 31st of October, 2015, the Neo-Nazi American Pol Policy Institute convention met at the National Press Club. Many well-known white supremacists were in attendance to get in. They had to run a gauntlet of anti-racist protesters who not only called them out on their racism, but also sprayed them down with silly string. On the evening of the NPI conference in 2015, white supremacists outnumbered protesters 10 to 1. This was ominous in the past. Small anti-fascists usually outnumbered Nazis by at least 3 to 1. This time, white supremacists were able to threaten anti-fascists without fear. At one point, an NPI attendee kissed the swastika on the anti-fascist banner, but the alarm bells had already s had been sounded. Some in the activist community realized that the era of neo-fascism had begun. In Greece and other European countries, the far right had been expanding for over a decade, with fascists like the Golden Dawn Party gaining seats in government. DC anti-fascists set out to learn about their new enemies in the US. The fascist Matthew Heimbach had visited Europe to witness some of the tactics that European fascists were using. He began to circulate ideas with the League of the South and later founded the Traditionalist Workers' Party. Richard Spencer, a wealthy fascist whose family received millions of dollars in subsidies from the U.S. government on account of owning plantations in Louisiana, spent a fortune trying to build the alt-right brand and turn it into a right-wing street movement. Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos taught fascist fanboys how to out trans women on Twitter and use the hashtag undocumented and unafraid hashtag to call ICE on dreamers. A few months later, on March 5th, 2016, the NPI organized a mini-conference at the Reagan Building in DC. 
anti-fascist anti organizers anticipating a growing fascist presence in D.C. focused on building coalitions to draw a large, larger crowd of protesters that had previously come to NPI action. While roughly 100 protesters, they succeeded in holding territory at the event. Between a rally with speakers in a line interfering with white supremacists as they entered, protesters utilized a diversity of tactics that set the stage for more actions later that year. The Trump era begins. Endorsed by former KKK leader David Duke and others in the growing alt-right, Trump's candidacy inciting a rise in fascist organizing and attacks for Richard Spencer and the National Policy Institute, this was a sign of their movement's success and legit legitimacy. When Trump won the election, nooses were hung at American University and in a black neighborhood in D of D.C. In response to Trump's victory, thousands took to the streets that day, after the, the day after the election, and held rallies and marches throughout the week. The following Friday, anarchists organized a rowdy night march that blockaded I-395, a major regional thoroughfare. Two weeks later, hundreds participated in direct action trainings. The NPI planned a dinner to take place on November 20, 2016, to be followed by a two-day conference. However, the venue canceled following a call-in campaign organized by smash, smash races in D.C. Protesters then followed the Nazis to a Magiano's Italian restaurant in the suburbs of D.C., where fascists had booked a room under a fake name. Protesters stormed the building after the fascists entered to cheers from ordinary restaurant customers. The next day, hundreds protested outside the conference itself. When a Nazi attacked one protester, anti-fascists knocked the fascists down and protected his target, sustaining no arrests. At the time, Richard Spencer was courting the media as the face of the alt-right, when conference attendees were, make, were seen making Nazi salutes at the Magiano's dinner and the NPI conference, this received national media co coverage confirming the protesters' message that alt-right was a rebranding of fascists. As Trump's inauguration loomed, the challenge of responding to increasing fascist activity compelled people to form the DC Anti-Fascist Coalition to provide an ongoing organizing space for anti-fascist action. Okay. I'll just cut this part out. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Go. Confrontation at the Deplorable. The DCAC organized a protest against the Deplorable, a fascist ball at the National Press Club on January 19, 2017, celebrating Trump's inauguration. Over a thousand people were in the streets to decry the Deplorable as alt-right media personalities, men's rights activists, and other Trump supporters came to the ball to sneer at protesters. Fascists in attendance, such as Vice Magazine founder and right-wing personality Gavin McInnes, threw punches at protesters before fleeing behind police lines. This sort of coordination between police and fascists had become all too familiar in the months since. Police used pepper spray and tear gas on protesters and threatened to kettle them, foreshadowing their tactics the following day. The action ended in a black block march that enabled protesters to exit the scene and disperse safely without arrests. The punch scene round the world. No, dude. Oh, boy. That's what they call this in the left wing media. That's sick. Thousands of people from all walks of life participated in demonstrations against Trump's inauguration on January 20th, including Black Lives Matter. What? I don't know how to read that name. Oh, Mi Gente. Mi Gente. I think. All right, including Black Lives Matter, Mi Gente, Show Up for Racial Justice, Climate Justice Activists, indigenous leaders from Standing Rock, anarchists, socialists, communists, LGBTQ people, feminists, and more. The day of resistance began with demonstrators blockading almost every checkpoint into the inaugural parade. Later that morning, flying squads intervened when Alex Jones, Richard Spencer, Bikers for Trump and others attempted to pass through groups of protesters. 
many of the stands at the inauguration remained empty. The tension heightened as the anti-capitalist slash anti-fascist march tore through the business district of downtown D.C. Frantic police scrambled to respond, ending in the mass arrest of over 200 activists. While the official march was broken up within an hour, it catalyzed street confrontations in downtown D.C. that lasted well past nightfall. In the ensuing chaos, one enterprising inter individual punched <sighs> Richard Spencer as he tried to give an interview, producing one of the most popular memes of the century. A limousine torch nearby became a nationwide symbol of anti-fascism. 10,000 people marched in D.C. at the Festival of Resistance. Over 5,000 people participated in the blockades, and several hundred took part in the anti-capitalist, anti-fascist march. Numerous other cities also held demonstrations against Trump under the banner Hashtag Disrupt J20. The Women's March the next day was the most widely attended protest in U.S. history to date. After J20. Following J20, DCAC focused more on outreach, education, and providing security at other actions. For example, days after J20, people across the country occupied and blockaded airports to protest Trump's Muslim ban. While dealing with the immediate aftermath of J20, anti-fascist bravely confronted Richard Spencer on two occasions. The first one was the evening of April 8, 2017, following Antifa Unmasked, a day of workshops including Black-led anti-fascism, Anarchism 101, and a discussion on the Black Bloc. That day, Richard Spencer planned his own gathering in front of the White House, presumably thinking that anti-fascists would be busy. On the contrary, anti-fascists mobilized to confront Spencer and his flunkies there, chasing Spencer for blocks as he fled, frantically searching for a taxi to take him to safety. The next week at Antifa Unmasked Part 2, participants discussed security, culture, and legal solidarity. Once again, Richard Spencer held a demonstration in front of the White House, smaller this time. Counter demonstrators were not able to respond in time and instead, of, and instead decided to go to his home in Alexandria. Old SHAC chants were brought out of retirement. Richard Spencer, we will fight. We know where you sleep at night. Police quickly responded to break up the small noise demonstration outside his house. Anti-fascists stuck together and withdrew without arrest. Despite the warning from police, this was not the last time that anti-fascists went to Spencer's home to hold him personally accountable for right-wing violence. May Day, 2017 As deportations ramped up, anarchists organized for May Day in solidarity with immigrant workers. Hundreds of immigrants went on strike. Restaurants all over D.C. shut down in protest of racist immigration policies. Demonstrators marched on restaurants that didn't shut down or were accused of wage theft. D.C. organized two contingents, one led by a coalition of immigrants, the other by a collaboration between industrial workers of the world yeah. and D.C. anti-fascist collective. I just paid my dues to the IWW. Nice. During May Day 2017, the anti-fascist contingent confronted and contained Pizzagate's conspiracy theorist Jack Posobiec, effectively ejecting him from the march. In the following weeks, when a small group of MAGA-hatted Nazis interrupted Alexander Reed Ross's discussion of his book against the fascist creep at a local bookstore, Anti-fascists sounded the alarm again, and more allies arrived quickly to chase the Nazis out of the venue. Anti-fascists in D.C. also played roles in anti-ICE, Black Lives Matter, 
no justice, no pride, and Kurdish solidarity actions. Kurdish solidarity, that's... <laughs> that's so no... No, it's not what I was expecting, but I'm like... It's, it's a pleasant surprise. It's because of uh, the Democratic Confederation in northern Syria. Oh, okay. It's a Rojava. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. A hard summer. In July 2017... DC anti-fascists joined in protesting a KKK march in Charlottesville, Virginia. Soon after, on August 11th and 12th, a large DC contingent joined in the dynamic process at the Unite the Right rally. As anti-fascists and anti-racists marched to celebrate the cancellation of the gathering, Neo-Nazi James Fields Jr. drove his car through the crowd, killing Heather Hayers and injuring many others. A large medic team from D.C. was on the scene to respond after the attack and help to organize mental health services afterwards. The tragedy in Charlottesville had far-reaching effects. The next day, as thousands mobilized in solidarity with Charlottesville, in D.C., anarchists, anti-fascists, Democratic Socialists of America, and the IWW marched on Richard Spencer's home. When the NPI began organizing their next annual conference for November 2017, the long-term impact of the events in Charlottesville became clear. While Richard Spencer had been courting the media the previous year as the face of the growing alt-right, by fall 2017, he had scaled back to work with only a trusted handful of fascists. After many years of hosting the conference, the Reagan building finally denied him space, citing security concerns. Although a small group still loyal to Spencer met in, Mar in a Maryland barn, usually rented out for weddings, they were expelled as soon as the owners figured out they were fascists. Since then, Spencer has not been seen in his home office in Virginia. He's been nearly, he seems to be nearly inactive here. The violence at the Unite the Right rally helped to undermine Trump. When he commented that there were good people on both sides expressing sympathy for fascists, the statement inspired widespread disgust, even among some on the right. The subsequent departure of Stephen Bannon and Sebastian Gorka from Trump's administration was sh were surely catalyzed by events in Charlottesville. Abolish ICE. In 2018, when liberals began adopting the radical demand to abolish ICE, national nonprofits and community leaders organized several marches, bringing out thousands of people. During this time, DSA and IWW members repeatedly confronted members of the Trump team at local restaurants. On two occasions, people protested outside the home of Stephen Miller, the man responsible for Trump's immigration policy. Unite the Right 2 Today, D.C. is bracing for Unite the Right 2. Neo-Nazis are planning to come to our city to celebrate the anniversary of the tragedy in Charlottesville. Don't let D.C. stand alone against fascism. We are calling all opponents of fascism and people of good conscience to participate in International Days of Action, August 11th through 12th, and a mass mobilization in Washington, D.C. This is for Heather Heyer, for the abolition of ICE, for the dismantling of borders, and the prison industrial complex, for the end of the settler colonial system. We will confront fascism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, white supremacy, and state violence August 10th through 12th. For more information, go to shutitdowndc.org. I think that's all. That's it? Okay, cool.